um, and back to the violence thing. So it's a really serious thing, but it's not just happening here. I mean, it's happening in all these other countries that are dealing with a global right. capitalist crisis. There's rising fascism. All right. You guys just getting queued up. Um, a little tired today. A little tired. Didn't sleep too well last night. That kind of happens. Can't sleep good every night. But um, kind of just wanted to talk about mine today. I wanted to talk about ownership. Uh, mine, 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 mine. Hey, Claudia, good morning. This is a pleasure having you on so early in the morning. Hey, Sonia, Brother John, Laura. I, wonder, I was thinking about borders today. I was thinking about, well, it's all related. It's all related. Like ownership and mine. And what is mine, 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 mine? Um, and, uh, yeah, yeah, I know, Claudia. I think I think it's uh, it's early, but I know you're up early working. I know you're up and at it early. You're you you and I have that old old way of doing things. Get up early in the morning. Um, I can't sleep in the morning. I have to get up. I had a father came out of the military. He used to wake up. You weren't allowed to sleep past a certain time. You know, my grandfather was out the house. You know, before the light even came up. And I just, I thought these guys were crazy, but they were, um, it's what you had to do, right? Like that's, that's something that came from our scarcity in the past. Get up early in the morning, get a lot done before the sun comes up so you can do everything else that you got to do. Good morning, Mary. So, but I was thinking this morning about ownership, right? Because a child, a child doesn't know the word mine until we teach it to them right like human beings we never knew the word mine until some culture evolved this word for ownership why do i think that's interesting i think it's interesting because before that was a world held concept of ownership that something on this planet belongs to me well, one, it all belonged to nature. I think that's the most important thing to think about. And we were a part of nature before we decided to dominate and kill and destroy everything and draw borders. But there are a lot of cultures, the more I read, that actually around the world never had a word for ownership. They never had a word for, you know, uh, this is mine or, or, or actually ownership. And that in a lot of the colonization that happened, that's when they were first introduced to the concept that the Native Americans, you know, because I, I grew up on cowboy movies. I grew up on little John Wayne. I'm a little old and uh, still watch the cowboy. And Indians were always the bad guys. The Indians, the Native Americans, they were the bad guys. They were always coming to take some horses. They were always coming to take things. And it was painted in this colonialism light. But in reality, a lot of the cultures, they just didn't have a word for ownership and they didn't understand that, which is why when we would say, I'll say we, when we, because my heritage goes back to, uh, I, and my ancestors were slaves, so my heritage goes back to Europe as well as it does Africa, and we were the most recent colonizers of America. So I'll say we, when we got here, um, uh, we, we couldn't understand why they would give us things and didn't want anything returned. They would give us skins. They would give us, uh, they were gift giving type of people. Uh, but a lot of cultures were that way from China all throughout Asia, um, even up through R Russia, there were different cultures. They'd never had ownership. You know, they still tied to that hunter gatherer that, you know, we survive as a species, not as, <laughs> an ignorant grouping of skin color. <laughs> but, but it's on my mind because I think about North America. So y'all see what's behind me. This, 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 is where, this is where I'm going with this. Thank you, Brother John. I love, this. I love the background too. It's important to realize that in human history, 
Human beings weren't violent. That's a lie. They're lying. Human beings are not violent creatures. We are completely not violent creatures. Like I said before, your greatest evidence of that in your genetics is when you do something good for somebody. How does that make you feel? What does it do for your reward system? It actually makes you feel good. It rewards you because we are creatures of love. We are not creatures of violence. More proof. How do you feel when you hurt somebody? You feel like crap. If you feel good when you hurt somebody, you're a psychopath. We need to hug you a little more. Somebody didn't give you what they need to give you, but you generally feel bad when you do something bad. So that's how we know we're a giving species and all of our reward systems have evolved for giving. Why? Because we lived in a violent world. We weren't violent. We, we lived in a violent world. We started to handle our scarcity early on when we started to group up into tribes and started to figure out how to work together in this violent world that was always trying to kill us. And uh, one of the great proponents of the violent world we lived in behind me is that's the short faced bear behind me. Well, let's not even go to the short faced bear yet. Let's talk about the tiger. Any of y'all who've gone to the zoo and you've seen a tiger, you know, a human being, a human being in a tiger cage, <laughs> the life expectancy is not very long. A lot of clips on, on, on YouTube about that. Um, we lived in a violent world and everything was trying to kill us. Everything, everything was out to get us. We were food for pretty much everything. And when you came upon other humans, your, 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 your need wasn't to kill them and take what they had. Your need was to, hey, can, can you sleep a little co close to the fire with us? Because we don't know what's in this area. You know this area a little better. And so, but anyway, so, so as, as short as the life expectancy of a short, uh, uh, of a tiger, a human being in a tiger cage, think about the life expectancy of a human in North America with short faced bears running everywhere. That is a short faced bear behind me. A human being they plagued North America. A human being, let me show you a picture. A human being could fit in the stomach. One human being, you could probably fit two or three. He was a little hungry. Could fit in the stomach of a short-faced bear. Let me show you this, brother. Could fit in the stomach of this thing. Look at this. How ridiculous is this? I mean, just think about this for a second. Why? <laughs> So now, now I always say good things about uh, our, our brothers and sisters, the Native Americans. But before they were Native Americans, and, and there are debates about China and, and the treasure junks in South America, and I know and migrated up from the South, I do know that. Uh, however, North America was dominated by this brother for obvious reasons, right? So who, who owned North America was nature until these things died off. And when they died off, somebody was able to migrate up from the South and that could have been, you know, um, South Americans and, and mixture of uh, the folks from China who got off the boat and, and, and people walking over the Northern Bridge. But even then there wasn't a concept of borders. It wasn't that concept of mine, 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 mine. Um, human beings, we were granted this planet. If you really think about it, we lucked up into everything we have because anywhere nature didn't want us to go, we couldn't go. And so for whatever reason, and, and different biologists, they disagree on what happened to the short faced bear, but he, he went along the way to dinosaurs, right? And come in, in comes the human beings and establishing, you know, perhaps we'll call them, you know, tribal territory. Later came the colonizers to establish borders. But the thing I, I'm thinking about in terms of this word mine and ownership, before there was that word, we all worked together and we all shared because we all needed each other. We didn't survive unless we actually shared everything we had, including information and knowledge, protection, security, medicine, everything we shared. Think about that. For 200,000 years, perhaps, 
we survive by each other, which is why what I say is, you know, every mortician has it wrong. You know, every obituary writer has it wrong when they say we survive by our wife or we survive by our husband or we survive by our children. That's all wrong. That's completely wrong. We don't survive by our immediate family. We survive by our society, if not our species. Because if we can't stick together as a species, um, we fall apart, we die. And so I think one of the things I appreciate about looking back at, at human history is we were scared into surviving together. We were scared into being brothers and sisters. We were scared into giving and sharing because if not, we die. Are we not coming into a time where this is starting to become the case again? I guess I'm not talking to the majority of people. I'm talking probably to the people who are actually starting to realize we got, we have some predators that are a lot more violent than short faced bears that are preying on us. We have some predators that are a lot more violent than tigers and, and, and saber tooth tigers. Some people who are really not tuning into the Coliseum as much and tuning into Hollywood and entertainment as much are realizing we have some forces that are coming after human beings that are killing a lot more human beings than what a short faced bear ever could, a large population of them, killing off a lot more human beings than nature ever has. You put together all the natural disasters that ever came and speculate as to how many human beings dissolved in the gut of a predator, and it'll come nowhere near the numbers of human beings, the 1% taken off of this planet. Think about that. Think about that for a second. Um, I know I say it a lot in terms of we live in a great time. We live in a great time because this is the first time the entire planet of human beings are connected. Before, we can only connect with a tribe we bumped into. We can only connect with, you know, so we can actually share this information as to who this enemy is that's eating us. We can say, don't go to North America. <laughs> it's something big and brown, has some teeth, and it thinks you're delicious. Don't go over there. And is that not happening today? Do we not have people all over the world of all classes saying there's something preying on us? Um, all very interesting today. I think about borders, the whole concept of borders and patriotism. I know, this, this, and this is, it's, it's that touchy topic because when you start to talk about it, you know, people want to, you know, America, 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 you know, they want to run with their patriotism. And, and the more and more I think about it, the more it bothers me. And, and let me tell you why it bothers me. We were given concepts by people who really hated us. They hated our ancestors. Where, where did these borders come from? They came from some really, really greedy, very small amounts of the population who moved into areas drew lines on maps and pretty much killed everything that was inside of it. People who perhaps whose legacy we shouldn't carry on. Now, I'm not saying that necessarily that there shouldn't be borders. I think what I'm saying is we can't lose sight of the fact that these are economic borders. That's what they are. These are not borders of family. These are not borders of species. These are not borders of anything other than how to secure more money, economic, economical borders. And to me, from that perspective, the borders actually make sense from a sustainability perspective, right? Because it's local economy that's sustainable. We don't have the technology yet to, to make commerce work sustainably all around the planet, to not have such economic borders. So I'm not necessarily down in the idea of borders. The borders from a love perspective, borders from a humanity perspective, borders of a who do you who do you look out for? Who do you care for? Who are you concerned about? Whose lives value more? Um, 
concepts handed down to us by people who raped and pillaged and enslaved many of our ancestors, stole their land, murdered them in cold blood. Why should we carry their, their ancestor? Why should we carry their concept forward? Um, other than from a sustainability economical perspective, mm -hmm. until we can get to some sort of a world economy where it's not run by 1% of the population. That's the, that's the only reason I think that, you know, I, I'm not yet ready. Um, I think somebody just said, uh, uh, who is it, Sister Mary? Oh no, uh, Brother John, that, that there shouldn't be any borders. I think, I, I do agree that there shouldn't be any borders, but from a long-term perspective, right? Like I think we have to think about the long-term goal. The long-term goal is humanity has to become one tribe. Um, uh, some of us already are one tribe, but we have to bring everybody else back into that tribe. But until that happens, we're not going to be able to get rid of that border concept. But in the meantime, we have to increase who we think of as family. We have to remove these concepts that are, that serve to divide us, right? So you have those who they want the borders and they're locked into that patriotism. Um, and then we have those who are locked into race and locked into these concepts, other, you know, masters, mostly slave masters and railroad tycoons handed down. Why do you want to keep all these divisive, family divisive, survival divisive concepts of very evil people, very greedy people? Why do you want to keep them alive? Those are the things I, I wonder. Our survival back then like now was based on understanding that everything in this environment was trying to kill us now mind you it's interesting that they weren't trying to kill us because they hated us they were trying to kill us because there was a lack of food right why why would a short-faced bear want to kill you why does a grizzly bear? Did y'all know it's grizzly bears in Colorado? I don't know if you knew that. I'm, <laughs> I'm going to put that out there. Biologists disagree with it. No, they just don't want to tell you because there's there's uh, uh, implications for actually admitting um, that there are grizzly bears in the wilds of Colorado. It's, it's grizzly bears. I'm, okay, you live in Colorado. You may not see me, <laughs> but but it, a grizzly bear even a grizzly bear. It doesn't want to kill you because it hates you. It, it wants to kill you because it has a hole in its stomach and it wants to put something in there and damn it, you might fit. <laughs> so it's that scarcity that brings out that wild seeming thing in human beings, you know, and in the wild kingdom back then. But when everybody has a full belly, they're not trying to kill you. They, they're not trying to put you in it. Um... And so that's 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 kind of where I'm thinking on something something I think we need to pay attention to. So I talk about how the internet it changes things. You know, Mary, I'm not sure if it's the new world order. I, I you know there there are a lot of different names and Illuminati and the Rothschilds and everyone, you know they 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 have different names for it. But it's significant that people are coming together and there are differencing of opinions that are allowed to be spoken about now. Um, I saw something this morning that kind of disturbed me. I try to stay away from the news because the news, they again, they kind of guide you in what they want you to think. And I don't like to think about what they want me to think about. I like to think about what I think is important for humanity, right? for, for our brothers and sisters. So I was looking at this this morning. This is out in the news this morning, the Washington Post. And it's, it's important that I'm reading to you from the Washington Post. But the FCC plans to roll back some of its biggest rules against media consolidation. As if we haven't already gone the wrong way with media, right? So if you think about it, what happened to independent voices in the news um, after the breakup of the communication bill, right? What happened to small time radio? It pretty much all went away. And why did it go away? because you allowed these monopoly media companies to come together and start to drive that conversation amongst tribes and people. So 
Now, and I, I when I first read this, I was reading it. I was feeling good. I was thinking, oh, man, they're going to get rid of, you know, Clinton. He didn't messed up the independent voices. And we're going to have a lot of dissenting voices to the establishment now. All the, the short-faced bears that are eating us. No, that's not what's happening, y'all. <laughs> so what this basically is, is they're getting rid of the, uh, I'll post the link. But they're getting rid of uh, uh the, the abilities for a lot of newspaper companies to also have television and, and, and other media channels. So they're basically making it easier to have a monopoly now, which is going to kill even further internet voices, dissenting voices, other tribes with other information. And why do I think this is important? And, and it's at the bottom of the trending section, like nobody's really reading about it. I think it's important because it's it's further creating larger media monopolies to tell humanity what to think, what to believe. And anything that hurts our internet voice, anything that hurts our ability to talk to brothers and sisters around the world is a bad thing. It's a horrible thing. Any consolidation of information that doesn't allow massive humanity peer review questioning is going to be a problem for us. Um, but this is where we're going. And somebody asked me why I said, well, why do you, why do you not, I know you have this concept of family and the human race is a family, but why do you call everybody your brother and your sister? I even call the elite my brother and my sister, because they are. I, <laughs> I might have some issues with them, but there is a psychological thing that happens when you call somebody your sister. There is a thing that happens when you call someone your brother. There are subconscious decisions that are made all throughout your day that you have no control of. I read a study once and it said 90, 99% of the decisions you make all day are done by your subconscious and how you program it. I call people my family, one, because I know they are, but two, because it changes how I treat them. Did you hear what I said? Subconsciously, when, it's, when, when, when we're on autopilot for 99% of our decisions all day long, it changes how I treat them. It means when they do something or say something that hurts me, I don't necessarily flip out at that. My first response isn't to be ignorant back. My first response, to be, I'll be perfectly honest with you. <laughs> my first response is hurt. That is, it is. People say stuff that hurts me all day long because no matter how they speak about me, I still feel as though that they are my family. The thing that I accept, I accept that behavioral scientists are much smarter than I am. Uh, 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 geneticists are much smarter than I am. Um, the epigenetic scientists, the new field of study, they know what they're talking about. And what they say to, what, they, what they've said to us is what most of the major world religions and ancestral understandings have all said they all said that you have no right to judge at all ever that you are not better than anybody in any way ever that you have become you are 100 percent a product of the genetics handed down to you and the environment that you were raised in a hundred percent that none of your accomplishments are your own, that you have no right to point a finger at anybody for anything, because if you were raised in the shoes of the most evil, foul person you can think of with their genetics, you would be them 100 percent. Wouldn't be any worse, but you wouldn't be any better. And I think that when you start to understand that all of these people are your family, that they're off the rails because we allow this in our the environments that we allow children to be reared in the scarcity uh, the violence i think it puts you in the right place in a mindset subconsciously 
it allows you to have empathy and to think about how do I help a situation as opposed to how do I make it worse? I know I talked a lot after Charlottesville. And you know, one of the, the tragedy about Charlottesville to me, because the little girl's mother understood and she forgave the gentleman who drove the car almost immediately after it happened. The biggest tragedy about Charlottesville is that afterwards we failed as a society. We failed. After every tragedy, we fail as a society because we don't think of everybody involved in tragedies are a part of our extended family. So we don't ask the right questions. We always ask the wrong questions. We always jump on sides. And I was talking to a good brother yesterday and we were talking about Charlottesville. And you know, what still bugs me is we're still not asking the right question. Not is, 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 this, is this brother in prison? You know, not if he's secure, cause he's secure and he's not, he's not gonna be hurting anybody else. But does he have kids? Does he have brothers? Does he have sisters? What community did he grow up in? Who else grew up in that community? How else did we fail the people who came up with him who feel it's okay and a good decision to drive a charger, a, a motor vehicle over somebody else's baby? That's the right question. But you can only ask that question if you can have empathy for everybody involved in a tragedy. We don't ask the right questions. Why was that little girl there? Why were both crowds there? Were there any agitators in that environment that made it worse and slipped away before the violence happened, which is what the journalists say, and that they have them on film, which is another important reason for independent journalism. I still don't think a lot of people understand that the independent journalists who were there said there were bad guys on both sides and they show up to every protest and they start the rebel rousing and innocent people get hurt and they know who these people are and they got them on film. But we don't do any prevention because we don't think of all of these people as our family. We don't. We get upset and we let emotions kick in and the emotion drives the lack of fixing a problem or being preventative to prevent it from ever happening again. And so we, the same problems get repeated over and over and over and over. And <laughs> brother John, I, you know, he, he, he said, I uh, started to sound like Buddhist teaching. And I appreciate that you said that. Um, I am a Christian, but I, I believe, I might be the weirdest Christian y'all know, but I don't believe probably what mainstream Christianity believes. And that's, and that's fine. I don't think we're supposed to believe the same things, but I think all truth is truth. And I think all truth was handed down through different cultures and it ended up being called different things to different people, whether it's Buddhism, Hinduism, Christianity, atheism. There's truth in all, you know, in all different sectors of, of, of knowledge. Um, ancestors never handed down anything that was ignorant. That's only the 1%. Ancestors don't, they didn't hand down ignorance. They handed down survival because again, behind me, everything on this planet was trying to eat us. All of this stuff was trying to kill us. Um, but this concept of mind and ownership, like I think all of this, it all plays together. And I'm starting to question in my mind, are we screwing our kids up by giving them something and saying, baby, this is yours. You know, Christmas time comes around, we buy them things. You know, this is not your brother's, this belongs to you. <laughs> I was the youngest, I was the youngest of three brothers. And I got a little sister too. But I didn't, I didn't have a whole lot of mind, mind. Well, we had it, but we didn't have a whole lot of it. I, uh, shirts, shirts would come down to me. They'd have my brother's name on it. I get a shirt and it'll say Reggie on it. <laughs> this is my shirt now. I get a pair of jeans. Because 
He was the, he was the, he was the, I guess he was the 1%. He was the oldest brother. Then I had another older brother, Daryl. Every time I get a shirt that had a name Daryl on it, I'm walking around school with a shirt that has his name on the inside of it. But I was the youngest and things got handed down to me. So I didn't, I didn't get used to a whole lot of mine. You know, I thought, I thought this was mine. Mom said this toy was mine, but mom wasn't around. You know, my brothers would take it from me. So I, <laughs> I think maybe the youngest. Ooh, there's something there, y'all. The youngest, the weakest. I wasn't weak forever. I got him back, but the weakest. The weakest probably are the ones we should probably listen to a lot. And I guess goes back to what we were looking at yesterday in Africa and some of the other weaker nations because it is the 1% that prays the strong is preying upon the weak. And, and it's all with this concept of mind. So that's kind of what I'm thinking about is maybe we need to get, I'm not sure we have to go back to a, you know, open and nobody owns anything. You know, that's, that's kind of pushing the extreme limits, but from a border perspective, should we really be saying mine? Like I get the whole economic reason sustainability but if a nation needs something why would we hold that back from them if we call other nations our brothers and our sisters if if our brothers and sisters are in russia and they're in syria and they're in iraq and they're in africa and they're in everywhere you can think of and they have a need we're not giving them aid we're giving them what's owned by the world family we're taking care of them so i'm gonna ask you to consider that today I'm going to ask you to consider the concept of increasing your family and starting to reprogram your, your subconscious to, to think of other people, the others, mainly the others, as family. I'm going to ask you to start calling people out for what they are. I'm going to ask you to start calling your brother your brother. I'm going to start asking you to call your sister your sister. Because when these schemes come down to go murder a bunch of them and take their resources, your immediate first response is no. You're not going to kill my family and take the resources that, that, that they live around. Nor will they let their people come here and kill me and take the resources I live around. Because perhaps all of this belongs to all of us. And a lot of it probably was a lot of luck because certain species died out which allowed us to get to that level. Um, so that's what I'm, th I'm, I'm gonna ask you to think about. Because I'm always trying to figure out how do we get out of this mess? How do we, like, you know that I love the Zeitgeist Movement and I love the Venus Project and everyone has questions about that. And I, I encourage you to go pay attention to Jacques Fresco and uh, Peter Joseph and some of the, the great minds working on what does the final picture kind of look like or a much more evolved picture? And it's a hard concept for people to embrace the idea of a resource based economy and no currency. But we have to make practical steps in how to get there. And we don't even get to a point where people start to think we need to be in a place of greater love and greater abundance. If we don't start to think about each other as family, as brothers and sisters. And I'm going to ask you to, to do an experiment. And I'm going I'm to end on this. I don't like to, to hold y'all too long. Um, I'm going to ask you to do an experiment. Maybe not everybody. If you can, everybody. Find the people who you're not supposed to like. Find your others. And make a conscious effort refer to them as your brother refer to them as your sister you know how many moms i have i have, I have more moms than i can count when my seniors come in hey they're i they're all mom i call a lot of people pop but if you can if you can transfer a feeling of family to the people that your group whoever you click up with tells you that you're not supposed to like the most if you do that for, say, let's say for two months, 
I guarantee you how you think about that person is going to change. I guarantee you that your subconscious responses to whatever they say is going to change. I guarantee you a lot of that mental thing that a lot of us have going on after the election won't click in when they say the name of whoever they voted for. Start speaking to people like their family because we got to think about the next steps before it becomes political, right? It's not, it's not anywhere near being political yet. We don't even know politically what we want to do. So before we even get there to talk about politics, because politics is problem solving, we don't even know the problems yet. If we don't know the people, if we don't love the people who are having the problems, we don't even, we can't even begin to talk about what a salute, a political solution could be for anything. Certainly not a progressive, all-inclusive one. We can think about what we want, but we want to jam down somebody else's throats before we talk to other people. So that's my challenge for you today. And I, I hope y'all run with that. I, the only thing I can tell you is that it changed me. That's the only thing I can tell you. I can tell you that when I started speaking to people with respect, when I started speaking to people with love, when I started speaking to people like they were family and I cared more for them than I do for myself, I actually started caring for them more than I do for myself. I actually started looking out for them more than I do myself. I actually started getting offended when people would say things to them that was wrong and out of their character and not true. And that's where I think we got to get back to. I think we have to get back to a time where we realize we are on a planet and there's always a predator. There's always a predator that's evolving and how to take us down faster and faster and faster and put us in its belly. And probably one of the worst things that could have happened to us is we got to a place of panacea and a place of minimal paranoia where we actually believe that there still isn't a predator, that that predator just wasn't replaced by something else. So that's what I'm gonna ask y'all to do. If you don't mind, give it a shot, give it a shot. Because I think once you understand that we all survive together or we all die alone in these groups that don't mean any well, I think then we can start talking about what solutions actually look like. But anyway, this is Gerard coming to y'all. Y'all have a wonderful day. I love y'all. And look out for the short face bears because they are still out and about. They just don't have fur and big teeth. They actually probably hug you and they got nice suits and they pretend to be your friends. Y'all have a good day now.